From the beginning of recorded history, people have coveted gemstones. Small, portable, and seductive in their beauty, jewels have tempted untold numbers of criminals into theft and even murder. So it's not surprising that valuable gems would play a large part in stories of crime and detection. In the adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, Holmes himself muses on the power of jewels to inspire desperate actions. He tells Watson, they are the devil's pet baits. In the larger and older jewels, every facet may stand for a bloody deed. In three of the Holmes stories, gems actually appear in the title, The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, The Adventure of the Barrel Coronet, and The Adventure of the Mazarin Stone. In the early story, The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, a valuable gem has been stolen and the Countess of Morcar has offered 1,000 pounds for its return. The stone comes to Holmes's attention after it inexplicably turns up in the crop of a goose and he recognizes it immediately. As he tells Watson, it is remarkable in having every characteristic of the carbuncle, save that it is blue in shade instead of ruby red. The usual definition of a carbuncle is a red gemstone, so that is very remarkable. Holmes, after much interaction with purveyors of geese, unravels the plot and apprehends the thief. In the only story set specifically at Christmas, Holmes lets the thief go because it is the season of forgiveness, and also the thief seems too stupid and cowardly to commit any more crimes. The story doesn't specify whether the stone's original finder got any share of the reward. I hope he did. In the adventure of the barrel coronet, an unnamed aristocrat borrows a large sum of money from a prominent banker on the security of one of the most priceless public possessions of the empire a beautiful barrel coronet. The banker then takes this national treasure home with him rather than leaving it in the bank's safe. What could possibly go wrong? That very night, three stones are ripped from the edge of the coronet and the banker's son is found in a very compromising position clutching the remainder. Since he refuses to explain what he is doing or where the rest of the gems are, the banker assumes he is the thief and has him arrested. At least the banker is smart enough to enlist Holmes's aid. It turns out that out of a misplaced sense of chivalry, the banker's son was trying to protect his beloved cousin who had been led astray by the son's own evil companion. Nobody in this family is showing a whole lot of common sense. But Holmes recovers the gems, the cousin disappears with her unscrupulous lover, the son is forgiven and the banker's reputation is saved. We can only hope that at least some of these people learned a lesson from it all. In the adventure of the Mazarin stone, a large yellow diamond that is implied to be part of the crown jewels has been stolen. These British aristocrats don't do a very good job of safeguarding their valuables. It's no wonder they lost the empire. Prominent members of the government, including the prime minister, the home secretary, and someone named Lord Cantlemere, hire homes to get the stone back. This story is based on the play, The Crown Diamond, and it reads very much like a play. It all takes place in one room with lots of dialogue and not much action. There's no indication of how the jewel was stolen in the first place. We mostly just see Holmes tricking the thief into giving it back and then playing another trick on the supercilious Lord Cantlemere who foolishly doubted Holmes's ability to retrieve it. Even when gemstones don't appear in the title, they are the main focus of several of the stories. In The Sign of Four, the second Holmes novel, the story revolves around the Agra treasure, the mother load of gemstones in the canon. By actual count, the Agra treasure includes 143 diamonds, 97 emeralds, 170 rubies, 40 carbuncles, 210 sapphires, 61 agates, a great quantity of barrels, onyxes, cat's eyes, turquoise, and others, plus nearly 300 pearls. These pearls get the action started when Mary Morstan comes to Holmes with a very strange story about receiving a mysterious package with a single pearl once a year. There follows a long convoluted plot involving the Indian mutiny and some prisoners and guards on a convict island. 
Eventually, the treasure ends up scattered across five miles of the bottom of the Thames River, and Holmes never gets to see or touch it. However, the loss of the treasure allows Dr. Watson to propose to Mary, the girl who would have inherited it. We see Watson's sentimental side as he declares that whoever had lost a treasure, I knew that night that I had gained one. The adventure of the six Napoleons involves only one pearl, but it's one of the more bizarre puzzles Holmes faces. Why is someone stealing cheap plaster busts of Napoleon, smashing them and running away? And why is he willing to resort to murder in the process? Only Holmes could make the connection with a famous pearl stolen more than a year ago from the Prince of Colonna's bedroom and hastily shoved into a still wet plaster bust by an Italian sculptor slash thief. After Holmes solves the mystery and recovers the pearl, does he return it? He tells Watson to put it in the safe, and that's the last we hear of it. Inspector Lestrade simply leaves Holmes' apartment without mentioning what should be done with it. You'd think a police official would be more concerned with the disposition of stolen property. The Musgrave ritual is another bizarre case with an even more bizarre resolution. A mysterious ritual in an English country house leads Holmes to a shapeless lump of metal and pebbles dredged from a pond. The debris turns out to be nothing less than the crown of the House of Stuart, concealed with loyalists in England after Charles I lost his head in 1649. For some reason, Charles II never asked for it back after the Stuarts returned to power. The Hurlstone family, the owners of the house, get to keep it after some legal wrangling and a substantial payment. This seems a little improbable. Also, I couldn't find any reference anywhere to a lost crown of the Stuarts. Either Conan Doyle made it up out of thin air, or the Hurlstones did a really good job of concealment. Sometimes the discovery of a gem or piece of jewelry gives Holmes the break he needs to unravel the case. In The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax, a single middle-aged woman disappears, kidnapped by fortune hunters. Holmes gets his break when they start to pawn her jewelry distinctive old Spanish pieces. He's barely in time to prevent her death by suffocation in a coffin, an ingenious method of murder and body disposal by the criminals. Various types of rings show up as clues in several Holmes adventures, starting with the very first. In A Study in Scarlet, the first Holmes story, a woman's wedding ring is found under Enoch Drebber's body at the initial crime scene. Inspector Lestrade misinterprets it to mean there's been a woman here, but for Holmes, it provides a vital clue to tracking down the murderer. In The Man with the Twisted Lip, the missing Neville St. Clair writes his wife a letter to reassure her that he is all right, and he encloses his signet ring to prove it's from him. Holmes doesn't think the ring signifies anything, but at least the wife takes comfort from it. In The Valley of Fear, the last Holmes novel, we have a mysterious murder in a country house. The corpse in question is missing his wedding ring, but still wearing his nugget ring. Would a simple thief have removed the nugget ring to get at the wedding ring, then put the nugget ring back on his finger? This oddity puts Holmes on the track that leads back to a fanciful American West of gold miners, secret societies, and Pinkerton men to figure out that the dead man is not who he appears to be. It's not always clear how Holmes gets paid for his efforts, but occasionally payment comes in the form of some valuable bling. A Scandal in Bohemia is the first Holmes short story, and Irene Adler is the first and only woman to ever outwit Holmes. In the story, Holmes is hired by the King of Bohemia to recover a compromising photograph, but Miss Adler is ahead of him at almost every turn. By the conclusion of the case, Holmes is so impressed with her that he asks for her picture as a reward, turning down a valuable emerald. However, only a few months later, in a case of identity, we see Holmes showing off a valuable snuff box that was a little souvenir from the King of Bohemia in return for my assistance in the case of the Irene Adler papers. Apparently, Holmes accepted it even though he had earlier turned down the emerald ring. The brilliant ring was from the reigning family of Holland, but the case was too sensitive to let Watson know about it. 
Neither gem has anything to do with the story itself. They're simply part of the opening repartee. The adventure of the Bruce Partington plans also has nothing to do with jewels, but rather with the theft of the plans for the Bruce Partington submarine. If not recovered, the plans would deal a huge blow to the nation's naval defenses. Of course, Holmes does recover them. Sometime later, Watson learns that his friend has spent the day at Windsor Castle and returned with a remarkably fine emerald tie pin. Holmes explains that the tie pin was a present from a certain gracious lady in whose interests he had once been fortunate enough to carry out a small commission. Holmes's modesty prevents him from naming her, but the implication is clear that it is none other than Queen Victoria. Unlike rings, pendants, and tie pins, bracelets as jewelry are never mentioned in the canon. However, bracelets in the colloquial meaning of handcuffs show up in two of the novels. Both Jefferson Hope in The Study in Scarlet and Jonathan Small in The Sign of Four seem very understanding of Holmes causing them to end up in handcuffs. Not only does Holmes nearly always get his man, he does it so smoothly that the man in question can only admire him for it, as do we.